There are a number of books and articles published by sociologists who were studying the effects of the hard-hitting booms, as some of you in this room recall from the 1970s and 80s. And those researchers did ask residents, such as yourselves, about those impacted communi communities. But I noticed when I was doing research that the individual voices really got lost when those results, when they published their results. That's part of what I wanted to get with this project. And we interviewed over 40 people in Sublette County and um, through the state to try to get all of that myriad um, viewpoints about energy develop development that's happened in your own backyard. And as you might guess, there's a lot of different viewpoints, not only on our panel, but um, amongst you in the audience. Four people, including myself and Ann Noble, member of our panel, interviewed the people here in Sublette County and the state, and a number of whom I see in the audience now. So I want to say thank you right now to all of those who sat with us for over an hour to, to talk with us. Um, I want to say to, I'm going to turn this mic over to, to Dr. Dave Kapp in just a moment, but I want to say on the side table there, you'll see some brochures about the American Heritage Center, about this oral history project, um, Wyoming Humanities Council, Emmy, and I'm, I don't get, didn't get your last name, but Emmy from the Wyoming Humanities Council is here. One of our funders, in fact, our main funder for this oral history project, as well as the School of Energy Resources really helped us by allowing us the money to film the two panel discussions that we've done. The event this afternoon is a chance to go over the viewpoints that were raised in the interviews, especially the views of the interviewees who are our panelists, and Dave will be introducing them in just a moment. We want to know, is there any media and elected officials here in the audience? I see one hand, media. And, and Don from Pinedale Online is here. Yeah, and Joel is here. And then Steve Smith, John McChesney from the Rural West Initiative, and Claire. Good, thank you for coming. I'd like to, to turn the floor over now to Dr. Dave Kafka. He's a former Wyoming State historian. He is going to give us a little background, a short background on, on boom and bust, and then he's going to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Sally and I. Uh, served on the Wyoming Council for the Humanities back in the last century. And uh, so it's very nice to, to see her again here. Uh, today we are examining one, and the most recent, really, of the economic booms that have ex been experienced by Wyoming uh, since it's been Wyoming and, and even before Wyoming. Uh, we're going to, we want to, to provide a little bit of historical perspective so that you remember that this is not a unique and isolated situation that, that you're going through up here. And certainly one of the very first uh, booms in what became Wyoming would have been happening just down the road here, uh, the fur trade. And maybe you don't think of it as an economic boom, but it certainly was. And it, it happened quickly, it came quickly, it came because of something that maybe nobody could anticipate, a change in fashion. So that the beaver became a, a hunted animal, a, a, a resource that was very prized, and it disappeared just about as rapidly when uh, the fashion changed. Uh, so you've, you've got that, and certainly with the Mountain Man Museum, wonderful Mountain Man Museum here, you, you people locally know, know a lot about that, but. Uh, also down, down the road a little bit, South Pass and gold mining in the 19th century. Uh, that developed a boom as people sought the gold booms, sought to, sought to pick up the nuggets off the ground and turned into a corporate kind of thing, uh, which involved a lot fewer people. And boom, part of it disappeared. The open range cattle industry was another major boom 
that Wyoming people experienced in the post-Civil uh, post War era and disappeared. I mean, it was an international uh, industry and then disappeared with the blizzard of 1886 and 87 and uh, some overgrazing that, that occurred prior to that. The coming, you know, I live in Rock Springs, so the coming of the Union Pacific and the construction of the Union Pacific and the development of all of the, those towns across uh, the southern part of the state remind us of, of that particular boom. Uh, the coal mining, again, of Rock Springs, uh, the undermine, underground mining that occurred in that area and uh, boomed really until, uh, and provided a good source of economic development until the switch in technology and the uh, use, of, use of diesel technology. And then natural gas production. Uh, one of the things you're experiencing right now, Sublin County began experiencing this again in the mid of the part of the last decade of the last century. Um, and some of the overthrust development caused a big boom in the southern, southern part of this county. And then with, again, with a change in technology, and oil fields, gas fields, that people hadn't thought they could get the, the uh, resource out of, uh, suddenly became very important to that. So the booms and busts have been with us. We're going to be looking at a very specific area and a very specific kind. But we also think that out of that, we can provide information for people going through another boom. And you know that one that is coming along pretty rapidly is over there in the eastern part of the state. So one of the things we've asked people to deal with uh, as we go through this, this uh, session today is what would you tell people in, the, in other parts of the state going through a boom? What, how would you help them prepare for that? We are very fortunate to have uh, this panel with us today. I'll introduce them. Callie McGee has called Pinedale her home since uh, she came here in the ninth grade, seventh grade. I was in between before. Yeah, fourth and ninth. So. <laughs> between the fourth, yeah. Uh, she's worked with the several of the major companies that are now developing gas resources <coughs> in the area and uh, ultra petroleum. Ann Chambers Noble, uh, with her husband Dave, she's a cattle rancher. Uh, moved to this area in Cotacora in 1988 when she married Dave. And in addition to the ranch that she owns and operates with, with Dave, she also uh, has a bed and breakfast, the Chambers House. And she's also a historian. I've heard her describe herself today as the town historian. So. Mary Lynn Worrell uh, has been a Pinedale resident, involved in environmental affairs in Pinedale. Uh, she grew up here, she went to school here, she went away to college, she went away for a career, but she came back. Uh, she came back in 2000 and her, her heart was always here, as we discussed. And she's been particularly involved in a couple nonprofits, Cloud, <coughs> Citizens Learning About Ozone Unhealthy, uh, and Curid. Citizens United for Responsible Energy Development. And Courtney Carlson. Courtney is the Assistant Director of the UW Hobbs School of Environment and Natural Resources. She has a multidisciplinary background that includes social work and higher education administration and literature. She's especially interested in the ways fine arts can expand and enhance environmental understanding. And finally, on the end, Dr. Mark Northen is director of the UW School of Energy Resources, Resources and has been in, in Wyoming since July of 2007. Uh, he's an expert in energy exploration and development with over 20 years of experience before joining UW. And he's worked in uh, energy development around the world for a variety of companies. So he will add a, a very interesting perspective. What we're going to do is start out with each of our speakers giving about a five minute introduction to their view of the topic. And then we will let them interact 
and we'll ask some questions of them uh, amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up to questions, uh, as Leslie said, from the audience. So, are you ready, Kelly? Yes. Okay. You come down here for this part. So good evening, good afternoon. My name is Callie McKee. I work for Ultra Petroleum. Um, many of you have heard me speak and represent many companies over the last 10 or 15 years that I've worked in industry. I do come and speak tonight um, just for myself and as a private citizen of, of Pinedale. So I think, as Dave said, I, my family moved here and I started seventh grade here. I graduated from high school here went to the University of Wyoming and eventually made my way home uh, to raise my kids who are getting ready to graduate from high school and leave home. And um, it's been a wonderful journey and opportunity for me to work in the oil and gas business. Um, having grown up here for a lot of my life, I kind of had no idea about the history of development in Sublette County and how long it has been here, um, especially in our South County. It wasn't something that I think growing up in Pinedale we were really aware of or um, understood the value and what it brought to the community and how long it had been here. So it was a real learning experience for me to um, come home one summer and be working at Lakeside Lodge and get offered a job to work for an oil and gas company. Um, my, my background, my degree is in natural resources, uh, kind of a general studies degree, so I, you know, I wasn't really maybe aiming for a job in the oil and gas industry. So it was a wonderful learning experience and it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to live in a small community that I um, grew up in and afford me the opportunity to raise my family here. And um, so I look forward to talking with everyone else tonight about kind of what that experience has been and what it's been like for me and what we hope to be able to share with other communities who are gonna see this kind of development happen because we know it's going to continue to happen all over the United States as we look for and develop um, the energy resources that we have here. So thank you. Let's bring it down to my level. <clears throat> when I was asked to speak on this panel, when, and I asked Leslie, well, what do you want us to talk about? Uh, one of the questions that kind of rose to the top is, well, what, is, what it, has it been like to be in Pinedale during the boom? And I think that's what really this whole project was about, was trying to gather all the different stories, different viewpoints of what, what's been like Pinedale since the boom. And I've concluded was I was fortunate enough to, to do many of those interviews. I think I conducted almost 15 of those interviews. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount about the people I live with in doing so. And I conclude the following, that these, this was the best of times for Pinedale, and this was the worst of times of Pinedale. Um, it was the best of times, with, undoubtedly, because of the economic boom that came to this area. Um, as Dave mentioned, I wrote the centennial history of Pinedale, and the one thing that has always been true about Pinedale um, is it's amazing the citizens didn't starve out every winter. Um, there was really hard economic times, very, very little money for decade after decade after decade until this boom came. Um, the boom that came in the 80s and even in the 50s to the county was really only impacted in the southern end. Um, and I remember when I was in church once in November in the mid-1990s, and in the bulletin it was asking us to bring canned goods to the food bank because there were 94 families that were depending on food out of the food bank in the mid-1990s, and that was only November. Um, many of, of the industries tried to make enough money to sustain themselves for 12 months on a three-month income. So no doubt the economic opportunities that were brought to this, this county were, un, were unsurpassed and we benefited greatly because of that. Not only were we given job opportunities, our children were able to come back and have employment, uh, people were able to stay. Uh, we were able to build a phenomenal um, infrastructure. I had the opportunity to interview Bill Kramer and really learned that the county commissioners, I felt, were very responsible in not only building important infrastructure and important shots, but at the same time, 
putting money away to maintain them then in the future wasn't, I think we all kind of got the idea, we're building all these massive buildings, now how are we going to sustain them? Well, there were funds already put in place to sustain them. And the last part that I learned and the best part I learned of doing this interview, what uh, I can't take credit for the, exp uh, the term, it came from Ward Wise, is how many unsung heroes there were, including people like teachers in this room that, uh, that ranged for kids that showed up from Louisiana in January with no coats. Um, they, they did coat drives through the, the, the churches to, to get these kids in ho cats, uh, coats and hats and, and gloves. Um, the, the, the sense of community really did come out in trying to help the people that were brought in because there weren't enough of us to, uh, um, to support the, the industry demands of, of employment. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that we weren't victims through all of this. We as a citizens rolled up our sleeves and said, this is coming, how can we help, how can we make this happen? Um, the flip side is it was the worst of times too, and of course, I'm sure we'll hear more of this, um, and so I won't, I won't go on too long, but of course it, the, the damage to our environment has been, been a, a, a horrible. It, the, the ozone level is terrifying to all of us. Um, the change in population led to a lot of uncertainty and fear. I remember what it felt like going to Failer's grocery store, which used to be my weekly social life because I was just a ranch wife, and so going to grocery shop was really kind of, you know, when you caught up on the town gossip. And my uh, transmission fell out of my car when I'm going into the grocery store and don't recognize anybody, and that was my hometown, and, and the un uncertainty of who these people are, and, uh, and, and then finally, the greed um, that came out in, in some of, some of us um, was, was heartbreaking. Um, even though we had many of those that were taking care of each other and had that sense of, of community, there was a whole lot of money to be made really fast. And uh, it seemed like uh, many of us just couldn't make it fast enough. And to see some of that greed that came out um, was disheartening. Um, and how quickly we forgot our roots of poverty for the 90 years of, of Pinedale and how quickly our standard of living changed when, when with this huge influx of money, I think needs to, to have um, force us to step back and pause and think about that. Once again, I'm Mary Lynn Whirl, and I would like to thank the university and Dave Leslie, Leslie did my interview, and my fellow panelists. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to have open discussion, and I think we have some diversity in the room. We certainly have some diversity here on our panel. In 1951, my family literally sold the farm, the house in town, and moved to Pinedale. My parents bought the Ford Agency here. Was it a good business venture? Yeah. Not so much, but I must admit, when Halliburton, Texas, El Paso were in here doing exploratory work, the family coffers were in better shape and certainly helped send my brother and I to college. But when I think about this close-knit community, the wide open spaces, the wildlife, the environment, and the way of life of living in close harmony with not only your neighbors, but with the nature and the environment that surrounded you. It was a great family decision. So when I think of my home, my community here in Sublette County, you know, I think of the New Fork River. I think of my neighbors, people I've known for 60 years. I think of people that I just met at the library or at the post office. I think about that beautiful rock, lichen rock out on the mesa, the, the deer and the moose in my pasture. So when I talk today, I'm talking in terms of my total feeling for this place I live and not just the community of individuals. My, individu my community is very broad and it's probably, you know, some of you share the same feel feelings. We're here in this beautiful building and I know oftentimes when uh, things are talked about, about the, the economic boom in our county. This building is featured, the PAC is featured, our new medical clinics. 
I love this building. I think it's wonderful. I'm a very uh, strong user of the library. But my view also, when I think of the library, I think of the tremendous usage of this library, the readership that this county has had for years. I think of Sally Mackey and my mother and other people in this community that started this whole progress and this whole progress or, uh, that ended up with, with this building and, and this system. So once again, that's where I'm kind of coming from. I'm an individual, like several other individuals here in the room this afternoon, who have challenged, spoken out on issues, questioned things, and I think that's what you do when you live in a community. I've also, one of the people, with, along with some of my cohorts, who have been called a wacko, I've been called an American, and irresponsible. Well, perhaps I'm a little eccentric, but I don't think I'm any of those. I recognize the economic boom and the benefits that the gas industry has brought to Sublet County. However, I also realize that we have a number of issues and some of them are very evident to many people. Some of them were evident from the get-go and some seem to have just continued to kind of crop up with time. So I'm talking about such issues as the pace of this development, the cumulative effects of the various gas fields and the, the uh, gas fields that are going to be coming in, the loopholes in the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, the lack of oversight and regulation with some of the development, the an impact on our wildlife, the impact on our cities, our schools, our medical facilities, all those social things. So these are issues that have been at the front of my mind and I have tried to be part of a group of individuals who have addressed these. My mantra has been that we needed to do more prevention, not put the emphasis on mitigation. Mitigation simply isn't going to work for some things. A few years ago I was subbing in the Pinedale Middle School as a math class and I almost stepped on a calculator and I told the young men at the table to, oh, pick it up. They said they could buy another one. And I said, well, no, this is a very expensive calculator. One student said, my dad works in the gas field. We own this school. The other kid piped up with the same thing and then one said, yeah, we own this school and we own this town. I also heard, I've heard several times, individuals say, this community wasn't anything until this gas field. Well, I tend to differ on both of those statements. However, I am afraid that our community is now defined by the gas development. Thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney, the first of the two outsiders here tonight. Thanks for having us. Um, when I asked the, the Pinedale panelists what I could add to this discussion, one of them, I think it might have been Anne, enjoined me to explain myself. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes explaining myself, tell you a bit about what I do, where I work, um, and then uh, give you a, my take on these oral history projects, this oral history project, and why I think this is especially valuable. So as Dave mentioned, my job is the assistant director for the Haub School of Environment and Natural Resources. The Haub School is one of three university units that fits under this larger umbrella of ENR, Environment and Natural Resources, at the university. Um, we serve students. I'm fortunate to spend most of my time with them, teaching and advising and overseeing the interdisciplinary program. Um, you'll see some of our students. Some of you may see some of our students in Pinedale later this week. There are a group of students taking a course called Energy and Environment, and they will be here on Thursday. Kelly, are they meeting with you? Probably. Okay. <laughs> if they are, you should, you should find out about it, I suppose. <laughs> They're meeting with a, a group of folks in the community, leaders and community members who, engage, who are engaged in the energy industry and in environmental um, activity as well. 
Uh, the second piece of what we do in ENR is called the Ruckelshaus Institute, and the Ruckelshaus Institute is sort of the research and outreach arm of ENR. Um, the institute is interested in advancing collaborative approaches to complex CNR issues, so engaging all kinds of stakeholders in these complicated problems. The third piece is the Wyoming Conservation Corps, and the Conservation Corps takes young people between 18 and 25 out for service projects on public and more recently some private lands. These guys are the distant relations of the Civilian Conservation Corps, which we all know had a real impact in this area years ago. Many of you know friends to our program, like the Haubs, the Kendalls. One of our standout students right now is Elise Stirk, a Pinedale native. Um, and you probably know Corfanta, as our associate director in ENR is a Corfanta. So we have our ties to this community, um, and we feel part of the family here. You might also know that the shared vision of all these folks that are engaged in ENR is to address natural resource questions in this state as they are. That is composed of contradictions and oppositions and incongruities and diverse, often very diverse, groups of stakeholders. As for me, I grew up in Wisconsin. I chose Wyoming for graduate school and I chose it again to be my home. I'm happy to live here now. I'm trained in the humanities and in ENR and I'm interested in the stories we tell ourselves, especially about the places that we choose to live. I'm not here as an agnostic. I see clear and incontrovertible evidence of ecological degradation caused by development. But I also know there's a population in and beyond Pinedale that has an immense appetite for domestic energy. In this morass, I, I do operate with personal political beliefs and convictions. I won't share those with you today. Um, what I'll share is my professional commitment to creating the conditions for the exchange of the best possible information among the people who enter these political and ecological scrums. Oral histories, I think, are one way to do that, sometimes pretty effectively. In an oral history collection, like the one compiled by the AHC, there is space for the members of a community to dream their multiple dreams, to feel distresses multiply, and to hold tightly to various convictions. So when we, when we read these oral histories, we hear what we know. That Sublette County is currently afloat on a boom mentality where emissions rise simultaneously with community wealth. In muddled regulatory waters, we have an industry and an ecological network both in flux with technology and habitat and wildlife populations together experiencing rapid modifications. We note many things that we already know. But hopefully, because of this project, now we're listening more generously. What I hear about this community in the histories and around this state is something that I like to believe to be true about the rural American West in general, and that is that the people here have a reputation of looking out for one another, even in tough times, even in sometimes hostile times, because our everyday lives remind us how deeply connected we are to one another. Scraps and fragments though they are, these interviews stitched together have a sender, love for a rural place, commitment to neighbors, and an investment in a way of life that will inevitably and sometimes painfully be transformed. I see this county and the national media taking more than its fair share of lumps right now amid a great deal of uncertainty and many unanswered questions. Nonetheless, I'm quite hopeful that your future won't be sold to the highest or the loudest bidder, be that environmentalism, industry, or any other single interest. Because the histories, I think, are inspiration for something very different. I think they say that the promise of the future can come from these unlikely fragments, from the texture and the variegation of all these stories stitched together. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, not quite evening yet. Um, I'm Mark Northam, Director of the School of Energy Resources uh, at the University of Wyoming. Um, spent most of my career um, in the energy business. I've been personally involved with energy booms in the Gulf of Mexico, the North Sea, the Powder River Basin, the Middle East. Um, I've also, through the course of moving around um, quite widely uh, facing these booms, or chasing these booms, seen other booms that are just as uh, obvious and just as uh, changing of local areas and sometimes far more benign, things like uh, the entertainment industry in Florida uh, moving into Orlando and completely changing an area. Um, the leisure boom in the area that I grew up on, the Delmarva Peninsula on the Chesapeake Bay, 
baby boomers retiring, uh, wanting a piece of heaven, which happens to be uh, directly adjacent to the waterfront, so that uh, an area when I was a child, I could walk out my back door with a shotgun and hunt, or out the front door and uh, with my fishing rod and catch dinner, is now completely uh, uh, inundated with motorboats and jet skis and, and farmettes uh, with their uh, dock right outside their front door. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I say about booms is that um, whether they're energy booms or any other kind, um, we really need to blame it on Thomas Jefferson because he's the one that convinced Americans that we have an unalienable right for the pursuit of happiness. And that's really what, what drives these booms. All booms um, have s things that are in common. Um, they're rarely pretty. The busts are almost always ugly. And uh, they change communities, period. Um, booms bring in new people. New people bring in new cultures. Um, they bring in jobs and earn earnings, but the main thing they bring in is change. Companies, states, employees usually uh, appreciate the booms because it's a source of new business, new revenue, new life for them. Um, but long-term local residents usually have mixed feelings. Some benefit greatly from the booms. But in almost all cases, there's a sense of loss for the, the way we were. Um, communities seem to seldom be prepared for a boom. I know the one that I grew up in wasn't. Um, I assume from what I'm hearing, I am an outsider, but I assume from what I'm hearing that Pinedale wasn't, uh, wasn't totally prepared for what they have faced. The one thing I, uh, I think that we have failed to do over time, and one of the roles of the university in this, uh, or one of the reasons that the university was so supportive of collecting this oral history is that we all need to learn from others. Right now we're in a situation where the southeast part of Wyoming is, pr is probably in the very early stages of a boom as energy companies are uh, rapidly deploying their equipment and their people to evaluate and hopefully develop the Niobrara um, uh, oil shale. Um, I know that uh, there have been meetings uh, where some of the Pinedale community leaders have spoken in public fora um, around uh, Cheyenne and other areas that are going to be impacted, but I, th I still feel that based on the uh, state's desire to generate revenue from selling leases, um, private citizens' desire to uh, uh, um, lease out their, uh, their property. Um, looking at the area, the infrastructure is completely undeveloped, and yet um, industry is anticipating yet another boom. Um, my purpose for uh, supporting the collection of this oral history and hopefully taking this, um, this panel discussion to other areas is that we can learn from what happened here so the communities can better pre prepare for what I think they'll be facing in, uh, in the next decade. Thank you. Thank you all for your introductory comments. Um, what we'd like to do now is uh, I want to give you an opportunity uh, as individuals to ask questions of your fellow panelists or make a comment about anything that was said. So, several of you people talked about the, pa the pace of development. And I'd like to know uh, if you have any more comments about that because that's, that again is uh, true of nearly any kind of boom that occurs. It occurs very rapidly, catches people by surprise, uh, and as I gave some examples, it disappears very rapidly sometimes too. So far, I mean, you haven't experienced that part of it right here. You had a little tweak with the downscale in the, uh, the national recession, but it didn't, the bottom didn't drop out like it has in some places, in like Parachute, Colorado, and, and places like that. Do you have any comments about that pace? Is, is there anything that can be done to change it? Is, uh, I, I, I think I'm one that did mention this. And I think what happened with this development in the Jonah Field, even though there had been uh, development in this county, I think, since the 1920s, there basically wasn't any baseline data gathered on socioeconomic issues, on uh, possible uh, 
implications to the wildlife, to uh, air quality. So there were, I don't think there were any projections. The pace that we started, uh, I think, with this drilling and uh, it went very rapidly. And then suddenly we were putting, put in a position to react rather than to plan and once again prevent certain things from happening. So that's kind of my comment. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? I think Mark, you, you also talked about Yeah, um, the pace of development is, is really an economic issue. Um, having been in the uh, energy industry, the one thing that you quickly recognize is that slow development um, is a huge drain on economics. Uh, the energy, energy industry likes to get into an area, mobilize its, its uh, forces, get wells drilled, get production online because it's production that produces the profits. The flip side of that is that communities are often not prepared to, for the influx of people, uh, equipment, the drain on infrastructure. Um, and so there's this healthy to sometimes unhealthy tension between the companies that have a profit motive and the communities that have, in many cases, a protectionist motive. Um, one of the things that has helped over time um, is the uh, application of, of um, new and improved technologies that allow both sides to accomplish some sort of a compromise between rapid pace of development and minimal impact on, on local infrastructure. Um, of the places that I have um, participated in these booms, the place that did it the best was, was in Norway. The Norwegians, um, I think, um, in the oil boom understood the impacts better than anywhere else I've seen and, and passed regulations that said no, no permanent uh, buildings, for instance, to, um, to house uh, temporary workforce that would come in. In other words, they didn't allow workforce to come in and build permanent buildings in a community that would have um, uh, negative impact on, on the community when they left, um, real estate values. Um, it was probably a, a, an environment that could accommodate that. So temporary housing, um, requirement of companies to um, essentially support the communities, uh, bring in infrastructure uh, to improve communities when, when there was a, a new development. But other than that, I think it's one of those things where communities have to work with the companies to try to find compromise because slow pace of development is, is such a huge drain on, um, on the profits of the company that basically the development won't happen if you try to slow it down. So, but upfront planning, I think, is absolutely the, the number one thing that's essential for communities and companies to coexist in this type of an environment. The term that, that Ann used was this is the best of times and the worst of times for Pinedale. And, and almost all of you, in one way or another, talked about there are benefits and then there are negative things that happen as a result of that. Um, what do you think are the benefits, most of the, what is most beneficial from this? Is it, is it the economy? Is it, you know, what is it that, that is good about this? I guess it in part depends on you know where you are in your life you know if you're in retirement or not but uh, for me the best of the times were the the economic benefits that were brought to this community while trying to raise a family we, uh, my husband and I were having four children at a time when the schools were f incredibly well staffed um, beautiful facilities the be best of technology um, having a business in town, I was able to pay two, three mortgages a year. Uh, I, 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 couldn't, uh, I couldn't have enough rooms at my bed and breakfast for, for the clientele. Um, the economic, you know, rather than losing fingernails to see if I can get my heating bill paid through the winter, um, I'm making money in the dead of winter. Um, so the economic, uh, the economic benefits brought on by the, the gas boom um, would, would be the most obvious. But I can't just talk about that without also talking about at home in Cora, the, the boom was nothing but bad for the ranching community. It was 100% bad for us. <laughs> you couldn't get any help anymore because we couldn't even begin to pay the competitive r wages. Um, you couldn't get a mechanic to help put your tractor together anymore. Just one human 
uh, interest uh, story that explains it all perfectly. My, my oldest daughter was, in, it was November of her senior year and had stayed late to take her ACT test. And when she, when she left to drive home from Tess from town, she had the family suburban. And so she was, it was a blizzard. It was November and you know how the, the, the snow was in your windshield. So she was following the white line to get home. And as she's looking down at the white line, she doesn't see the big deer that runs in front. The deer, she hits the deer total. Well, it doesn't total the suburban, but it's, it's rendered useless. So she gets it off. Um, we call the local uh, repair shop. This happened the second week of November. The earliest he can get it in is April. So it's parked behind our shop, and we're without a, our, the family suburban for the entire winter. Now, a mile and a half of our driveway is j the highway to the ranch house is our own responsibility. It's not plowed. You can't get a car through it most of the time. <laughs> We're stuck on a ranch without, you know, the family suburban. So just life also became, even though we had great economic times because everybody was crashing their car with deer, <laughs> the one repair shop was unable to, uh, to keep up with all of the business. And so when you became completely overloaded, um, it, it became very, very difficult to, to live in those great economic times too. Well, I would have to concur, certainly the economics, the job opportunities. The boom has also brought more diversity to our community. And I think having diversity within our population is good. But on the other hand, I think that has caused some problems. People don't know how to handle diversity when we were kind of a close-knit little group before. Uh, and for me personally, uh, I guess we're supposed to be talking about the benefits. I retired in 2000, moved back to Pinedale. Thank goodness I had family property here and I had purchased uh, a house and some land about five years before I retired. Because if I had not done that, I couldn't have retired and moved back to Pinedale. And I have even thought like, wow, should I be here on a fixed income? when one, it's very difficult to get an electrician, to get a plumber, and then I'm not sure I can, this is in my budget. So, uh, like Ann said, and as there's, there's pros and cons as we look at the benefits and, uh, and how, I think when we look at the benefits and also the, the negative aspects, we have to look at the individual sets within our community and they're gonna be impacted differently. I think as a retired person on a fixed income, it's gonna be very different for me than somebody that has a working family opportunity. You know. I guess I would just say quickly that um, I think both Ann and Mary Lynn made the point very well, which is you should have some realistic expectations. Um, if you're to talk to another community who's looking at this kind of boom or development coming into their community, um, it's not going to impact everyone the same way. It's not gonna be great for everyone. It's not gonna be horrible for everyone. Uh, if that boom hadn't happened, the mechanic that Ann couldn't take her car to might have gone out of business. Um, so I think with any change in a community, there are positives and negatives, and to have an expectation that we're gonna come and develop uh, 4,400 wells in this community and not have an impact, both positive and negative, is an unrealistic expectation. Um, and I think maybe that's something that we could also share with other communities is um, you need to be realistic about what's gonna happen in your community. Courtney and Mark, do you have, as outsiders in this particular situation, I mean, these people are talking about the inside, as you come into this community, do you have any thoughts about what might be the benefits or the negative sides of, from what you see? Not from what you've necessarily studied, but. The same things you can substitute, uh, in my case, retirement boom, and it's exactly the same things. Property values rise, uh, local businesses um, usually benefit because of increased uh, uh, customer base, increased activity, but uh, 
there are other there are other detriments. Um, especially in my case, it's the big detriment is the hospital. You can't get a doctor's care because we're full of uh, of retirees who are who are using up all the local. So I think the the truth is that there are there's good and bad, and the and the real trick is is trying to anticipate what it will be and planning for it. I, I won't tell you what um, you may have felt as positive or negative because that seems like dangerous territory to me. But um, I can tell you that my observation is that you have uh, a lot of young people who are part of a very engaged citizenry. And I think that's because of the way in which they've felt these impacts. And I'd be interested to hear from the panelists a bit more about um, the folks that were coming of age during this energy boom and the way in which they think about it and perceive the costs and benefits of development. So can I pass it back to them? Okay. Um, we have a daughter who's now 21. She's a junior in college. And I interviewed her for this project because she is that perfect generation that when she was in elementary school, this was a completely safe town and she could walk from this end of town to even as a kindergartner to that end of town for church school because I couldn't be bothered to come all the way in to drive her and this was just a, a completely safe town where she was able to do that. Um, then the boom hit when she was in middle school, seventh, eighth grade, and we wouldn't allow her for, to walk from the middle school to the other side of town because we were so scared of what was on Main Street and how much traffic that was there. Uh, and while she was in high school is when huge scholarships were coming in and, and they were given laptops to work in school and smart boards and she was, she was just that, per she graduated in 2008, so she was that perfect class of um, not, a, not a lot of money in the school system when she started and the, the, probably the richest school system per capita in the nation by the time she graduated. Um, and, and, and in her interview, it was very interesting for her to describe as a child, you know, how initially when the first influx of like the management kids came to town in middle school, that was really cool because they really helped the basketball team out and they really helped the volleyball team out. But when the next wave of kids came in high school and they weren't necessarily so much the management kids but more the working class kids and they had like dyed black hair and pants that didn't come all the way up to their waist and they weren't dressed in any colors, it was all black and they were really different. That's when she saw the high school fragmenting and the high school then got to a size where they then got kicked into a bigger um, district competitively and she said we went from winning everything with this first influx of kids to losing everything because we were just the wrong size. But the most profound moment for me though in her interview was at the very, very end when just the week before she left, she went to college in Spokane. Um, the week before she left, she and a friend decided to climb McDougal Gap, one of her favorite mountains up in, um, in the Wyoming range. And she was on, they, they, they got up at like three in the morning, it's their thing to, to get up there for the sunrise. And so it was an August sunrise, so that it was her last morning, she was gonna see the sun, the valley and see her home where she grew up on a cattle ranch as a fifth generation on that ranch before she took off for college and she, she couldn't see anything. It was all full of pollution. And her last comment in her interview was, you know, I'd give up all the money I was given in high school and middle school, all the advantages we had for money if I could just have seen my ranch before I took off for college. I think this is kind of related, and I know it came up, uh, Callie, Ann and I are all from the Pinedale Cora area. And I remember reading uh, uh, a study that was done here where they interviewed uh, the high school students. And there was a big difference between the high school students in Pinedale and in Big Piney as far as a interest or a desire to stay here in the county and work in the gas industry. The Big Piney Marbleton area was much more favorable for that than the Pinedale area. I, I guess we're talking about youth and that, that, that came to me. Uh, and once again, I think if we probably had somebody here from Marbleton Big Piney, we might get a little different perspective on some of these questions and, and this whole issue. 
I should mention that uh, we, in fact, did invite some people from Marbleton Big Piney area and they, what they weren't able to, to come to this particular session. So it's not as if they ever were excluded or anything. So. Uh, I'd like to follow up a little bit on, on what Ann said, her daughter said, uh, about being willing to give up all of that to basically, I mean, in her instance, it was to see the ranch again from that perspective. She could give up all that other. But Mary Lynn spoke very eloquently about the sense of community that was here and so forth. I mean, are there people here, are there people on this panel who would give up all those economic benefits to have that close-knit sense of community back? It's fairly easy for me to raise my hand because I have that fixed retirement income. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, this is a double-edged sword. I, I realize that we, we have to you know, have jobs and we have to support our families and there's that have the energy for the nation. But would I love to drive out on the Jonah area where I used to go and uh, camp? Dora Skinner, some of you know the Skinners. Skinners spent many summers traversing that area out there. Would I love to go and see that all pristine again? I, I'm admitted, yes, I would. Is that a realistic dream? No. But I would, you know, I, I would love, uh, I, I think right now there are people here in, in Pinedale, one, you, that don't know their neighbors. And unfortunately, I don't think they want to know their neighbors. Whereas, I, when I grew up here, and I think probably when Callie grew up, uh, we knew our neighbors. We wanted to know them. We interacted with them. We had a common bond with, with the city. We had a common vision. We were uh, content, or a way of life was once again living in, in harmony with our, our wildlife and, and, and nature. And I think we have, we have lost that. And so yes, I would like to see that go back. Change is inevitable in any community. We have just seen such tremendous change. Uh, while my daughter was loathing you know her her pop, uh, pollution situation um, I can't say I wanted to give that all up because I was the one that was paying the mortgages and I was able to afford a private school for her <laughs> in Spokane um, so I think sometimes if it's a perspective of a, of a child versus an adult and for me I did appreciate the economic benefits that were brought on that enabled me to be able to give her so much um, and Marilyn, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with, uh, I disagree with you some. Of course, I, didn't, I wasn't born and raised here. I only spent some summers here as a kid. I didn't survive the winters as a kid. But I guess what I was in thinking about the boom and in listening to the, those people I interviewed, I'm not sure we lost our total sense of community. I still think there was always still that underlining sense of community. Not only were we concerned about ourselves, but there were many people that were concerned about the people that were coming in. Um, there really wasn't the, the divisiveness that I think sometimes we believed there was. There may have been it in part, but that did not define us as a community. I still think we maintained a sense of community through it all, and we still have it now. It's an argument. Oh, no, this is, <laughs> is it, no I, I think, you know, this is to express different views. I think we are somewhat fragmented as a community. I think we have a lot of sub-communities or communities within our communities that do not interact with each other the way we used to. And certainly within those sub-communities, there are good things happening. I think there are many people that have come here in the gas industry that have bought into this community, bought into the values. They've been excited to move here and raise their kids here and go to school here. And they get involved, they get involved with organizations maybe through their church. But then on the other hand, there are many people that have come here solely for the job and must be kind of a shock coming here in the middle of the winter. There's one, there's no Walmart, one grocery store, wind's blowing and some of the long hours these people have to go out here and, and work. And then we've had a lot of people, and I don't know, I don't think this is so much true now, that were 
in and out of here. What? Work three weeks, four weeks, and then they're off. They're transient. So they've never really gotten an opportunity to interact with other people. And I think there are probably people that live in certain areas of Pinedale or Sublet County that all their neighbors are new. And so you, we've, that link to, I'll say, kind of the foundation of people that have, have been here is, is lost because of, of uh, this influx and the way the housing is. And so I, I think there's not a cohesive sense of community. There's a there's sense of community within our little communities that are doing very good things. So many places to go with this. Um, I, I think in many ways, in, I think maybe in some ways it's generational um, that, that I grew up moving from community to community with my parents as they went to college and as we moved out west and as we moved to Pinedale. And for me, and I think for many people in my generation, we're much more comfortable with change. Um, and there is a lot of change in this, in this community. I mean, I, I think that can't be denied. Um, and I think, you know, Mary Lynn and Ann both, we, we could sit here all day and, and talk about all the great things and all the negatives. There's always positives, there's always negatives. Um, and, and definitely that sense of community is different, but I think it's incumbent upon everybody in the community, whether it's me or, or someone else, um, to reach out to the person who moves in next door if you don't know them, um, and, and to continue to create your own sense of community. I always tell my kids, you can't make other people's choices, you can only make your own. Um, and I think Mark also made a point earlier about temporary housing, man camps, workforce facility housing, and, and Marilyn discussed about people who work shift work, two weeks on, two weeks off, three weeks on, three weeks off. It's very much a part of the culture of the oil and gas business. Many of those people have homes and are entrenched and ingrained in the communities where they've lived for the last 20 or 30 years. Their wives and children or husbands and children are there. And that's really a part of how we do business and how we develop. Um, and I think it's important, like Mark said, that communities are aware of that and provide that kind of temporary influx housing for those kinds of workers who really aren't going to come here and be you know, an integral part of your community and what happens here. They come here, they work 24 hours a day, um, or they work 12 on, 12 off, and then they go home for two or three weeks. Um, so you need to kind of validate and understand all those parts of how this this business works. So, uh, I'd like to ask one more question of the panel before we open it up to, to the audience. Um, what role should, and this was particularly for Kelly and, and for Mark, what role should industry play in mitigating or, pre or preventing, because the term prevention also came up, mitigating or preventing boomtown effects? And anybody can comment on this, but I'd like to start with that. Well, I mean, I think clearly we have a vital role to play in that, in that we're the proponents of the development. Um, but that, that role has to be in conjunction with, you know, state and local government, uh, federal government, if you're operating on federal land, um, and community members. And we can do that um, individually as companies. We can be kind of forced into that process through NEPA processes or, or public comment processes like that. Um, so I, I think we have a vital role to play and certainly in mitigation, whether it's uh, preventative, um, operational best management practices or learned mitigative responses. Um, and certainly the community and the government agencies and I'll have a role to play as we have those conversations uh, in creating some balance in where we end up in what the development looks like. In my experience, I've seen um, both good and bad uh, operators come in into areas. The good operators invest in the community, get involved with the community, um, develop a, a sense of community. Uh, the bad operators come in. Uh, and do their business, um, take, take away from the community, perhaps move in uh, temporary people. Um, I think uh, the things that the, the good companies do, and some of them are in the room today, represented by people in the room today, 
is that they think about uh, the community as they work their developments. Most of the um, energy companies understand that they have to operate environmentally uh, responsibly or they're out of business. And so regardless of what a lot of people think, they have a lot of support in their companies for making sure that uh, uh, disturbances at a minimum. Uh, they have plans for how to put things back. Um, not just the oil and gas community, but if you look at what the, uh, uh, the good coal miners have done um, in the state, in the Powder River Basin, where they've moved away from, from an area that has, that has played out, they put it back. And I, for, the, for the good operators, I would challenge you to stand in the middle of a previously mined area and determine where the boundaries were, because they do a superb job. Um, what the state can do, um, what the regulators can do is recognize the good operators and give them uh, preferable treatment when it comes to assigning leases and, and, um, and things like that. Commun I, I'm, I firmly believe, having been on both sides, that industry has the, uh, the lead role in ensuring that when they operate in an area that uh, they uh, disturb as little as, as they possibly can that they uh, um, integrate into the communities, they invest in the communities, and they have a plan for how to, uh, to leave it in as good a shape as, as is technically possible. Um, I just want to quickly mention that the Ruckles House Institute is, uh, one of our initiatives right now is to work on um, evaluating the efficacy of both on-site and off-site mitigation practices. And so in the next six months to a year in the state, I hope that you'll see some information from our group um, that evaluates practices to date and also sets some standards for future best practices with respect to mitigation. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who has a question? So, my question is, uh, since the boom in Sublet County involves almost entirely public land, and the anticipated boom in southeastern Wyoming will involve primarily private land, uh, I just wanted the panel to, to kick that around and, and talk about the, uh, the similarities and, and differences, because there will be some. Anyone want to address that? Quickly, I mean, I, I think the, the obvious difference, and, and we experience with some of the development we see that's occurring out east right now, private land development um, puts the money into the community in a very different way, I think. Um, it, it tends to uh, enrich many more individuals as they develop and sell their mineral estate and or um, get compensated for service damages on their private land versus what happens when you have all federal development, uh, mostly the majority occurring on federal land and federal minerals and how that money comes back into the community. Um, and I, I, do, I do think it tends to make folks look at it a little differently when they see their neighbor having a well drilled on their property and making you know thirty thousand dollars a month in royalties versus seeing the federal government drill a well on their private property with federal minerals or federal federal um, and it enriching perhaps the, the federal government so it would be interesting to hear what everybody else thinks I, I could comment on this, but it might, uh, I'm trying to get Dave's attention, tie in with I think the last question he's going to ask us. Can I go ahead and use, um, uh, Citizens United for Responsible Energy Development has actually had uh, a group from Montana, and the drilling was mainly going to be on private land, came, I, I know they met with the county commissioners, they met with us. And I think probably they met also with industry because they had basically kind of the question that you've asked and, and some of the questions that have been discussed this afternoon. And we've also had from the eastern part of the state people contact us about, gee, what should they do? I think regardless where the drilling is going to be and, and people need to set up that rapport with industry, set it up early meet with industry, take the initiative to do it. And I think uh, that perhaps was not done here in the earlier earlier stage, stages. Uh, they need to understand, they need to have a, a kind of a, a clearinghouse for information. 
They need to talk about the impacts and project the impacts. Uh, who regulates what? Is how, how is it going to be different on federal land than on, on private land? Uh, find out these things. Uh, hold the agencies, hold industry accountable. And then, you know, I think people need to sit down and really talk about uh, what their, how is this going to impact their community and what values they want to retain and what their community, they want their community to look like during the boom and after the boom. Uh, I'm going to express an opinion rather than um, uh, something that is based in, in really hard, hard fact from, from research, but I think that uh, booms that occur on private land are far more divisive to communities. Because I, I grew up in, uh, I lived in Midland, Texas for four years in the very early, well, 1960 to 64. And one thing I saw in the community was it created a, um, it created a, a group of haves and a group of have-nots. And the have-nots resented the haves because they were the ones that invited the activity into the, uh, into the community because they sold their leases, they sold their lands. There was a certain amount of jealousy because, you know, unfortunately, um, um, energy resources aren't uniformly distributed. Some were lucky and some were not. And the ones that weren't had to put up with all the activity, um, but got none of, none of the benefit. I think that in a case like, uh, like here, where the development occurs on, on uh, federal land, it tends to pull the community together because uh, um, we're all in the same boat together. We have this activity that's forced upon us. So, in, I'm, I'm a bit concerned, and I'm already starting to see um, some comment in southeastern Wyoming of uh, folks who are blaming their neighbors because they have sold out to, to big energy, and yet they're going to have to uh, um, live with the impacts on, on uh, view shed, uh, new roads in areas that have historically been prairie, potentially impacts on water, and they don't get to participate in it. I think that, uh, just to sum up, uh, um, that those communities are going to have to work very hard to, to uh, keep from having their, uh, their communities fragmented by this. Any other questions from the audience? Let me give you the, the interviews that were done. Um, was there any expression, I know of one, certainly, of what's happened to our tourism industry that was one of the mainstay industries in this county when we were still poor, but it kind of still held people together. And, and of course, I think, feel that that has just been tremendously compromised in this county. People in that industry, and it's more than just motels and restaurants, it's by far and away more than that, has been incredibly compromised. And I just wondered if there were tones of that in the interviews that were done besides the one that I'm intimately familiar with. Prior to the boom, as I had mentioned, I think in my earlier comments, the, the, the main economic mainstays of, of Pine Dell were agriculture, mainly cattle ranching, which was wholly negatively impacted by the boom, as I already mentioned, and tourism. Uh, and that was a mixed bag, because like myself, I was very dependent on tourists prior to the boom. Many of them did not come in the winter, but that was replaced with energy personnel, and it far surpassed. The, pay, the payment now for us is now, because the, the energy folks have, are not coming like they used to, and I haven't been advertising for tourists because we haven't had room for them. And so right now we're hurting very badly because we, we don't have those tourists again because we sent them away because there wasn't room for them with the energy also. So um, the, the, two, the two original industries to this area for 100 years, agriculture and tourism, were the most negatively impacted by the agriculture, uh, by the energy boom. Why don't you speak, I mean, from my occupation, how um, it was negatively impacted to the, to the um, agricultural community? Okay, uh, we couldn't get help, hired help, because we pay, you know, 50 cents an hour. <laughs> We feed them well. I mean, what we would pay in a day is what they could get for an hour um, out on the rigs. Uh, just things like we couldn't get service anymore in town. We couldn't get our tractors fixed. We couldn't, I remember telling the story about how my husband Dave sends me to town with a flat tire for a tractor during the hang. 
which he does every year. And so you drop it off at the tire shop while you go get the groceries and you go pick up the tire and you go home. You can't get the tire repaired. Uh, the gas prices soared. You can't get gas delivered because the gas is, is, is gone. Uh, and then probably one of the bigger, um, we move, everybody moves their cattle to forest service, uh, to forest uh, or BLM, and we use the highway, because in the state of Wyoming, the cattle has the, the right of way. And we used to avoid weekends, right? I should have my husband answering this, because that's when you had the 25 cars from Rock Springs on the highway. And um, so we would move our cows during the week because there was only four cars from the people in Kendall coming down. Well, now we have 50 cars going up and down. They're late for work. They're in these humongous Duramax pickups, and they don't understand. Those are little calves that don't know to get away from your wheel. And, and just moving cattle became tr a, t a tremendous burden. And so then we moved from weekdays back to weekends because there was less traffic on the weekends with all the tour, uh, all the tours. So it, those are the, Thanks. am I missing something, Dave? <laughs> Go ahead. You know, for all the hardships that, I don't know, uh, Miss Noble mentioned for one, and this may sound a, a bit scathing, but I don't have time to dance around it. Uh, you know, the, the way you put it is, everything became harder for you, but at the same time, a lot of stuff around here became easier. You know, just to get, I don't know, basic groceries to the grocery store, availability of certain goods, availability of certain services may not have been available. And you yourself said your, your bed and breakfast is full all the time. You know, well, it was. It's still, you know, I probably guess that it's still making a bit more money than it used to. Um, you know, you, you all say you don't like certain things, but we wouldn't have the community we have now. We wouldn't have the library, the pack. This place certainly wouldn't look as nice as it does without the oil and gas industry. And, you know, with all the bad things you mentioned, it may be a tad hypocritical with all the good things that we have got. Comments? Fair. I think they think your comments fair. <laughs> and I think we're also speaking to maybe a bit of generational difference. I think whether you're on the oil and gas side or you're running a small bed and breakfast or you're retired here or whatever it is, that we're all hypocrites in our, in our own way. I mean, it's, it's very true that um, we'd like to have our cake and eat it too. I think that's pretty typical of most people. Um, and it, it's hard to find a balance. It's, and especially in a small town where everybody knows who you are and what you do and what you say. I think, you know, when I was in Laramie sitting on this panel, I, I said to folks, I think it's actually very courageous to live in a small town and be willing to speak publicly about what you think and how you feel. Um, I myself would never say to Mary Lynn that I think she's a wacko, um, because I think it takes a lot of courage to stand up when you have to be held responsible for your opinions and your ideas. In a big community, whether you were in Denver or Salt Lake City, you could go to a public meeting and speak your mind and probably never see those people again. I have to see them at church and at the grocery store and at the gas station, as does everybody else. And so um, it also, you know, I, I think I've, I've said before, makes for interesting bedfellows. It also makes for interesting relationships when somebody works at an organization that comes to ask me for money um, and then the next day they say something negative about me in the paper and somebody in the paper has written about this recently, you know, do, do you get to uh, criticize the industry and still ask them for money? Um, and so it's, living in small communities tends to make hypocrites out of all of us, but it also makes us responsible and, and it makes us courageous in many ways to, to speak your mind and be willing to take the heat for that. Uh, Bernie Holt's Game of Fish was one of the guys I interviewed, and uh, he said that we're all willing to turn our thermostat down a degree or two, but we're not willing to turn it off you know, when it's 20 below zero. The reason that the gas boom has been so successful is that we're all very energy dependent. I'm the first one to admit I like my food warm and my, uh, my, my house warm and I drive with my car too much. Um, so uh, we all have to be very critical. Critical. Uh, I mean, careful about criticizing energy. You know, even though there's the downside, 
we are the reason that uh, that we have that the, we are part of the reason that there is such the demand. Um, and I did go with her once out on a tour for Encana um, on a, to see the, the the site itself. And I have to say, I that was one of the best things I ever did do is with as a citizen. And I think everybody should do that because how, what I left with was this incredible admiration for the people that work out there. Um, it it is hard, hard work. What those the literally backbreaking work. What those guys and gals are doing, so that I can have my warm house. I think it's somewhat we're talking about values and what we value as individuals. And I think when I was 18 and graduating from Pinedale High School, my what I valued is very different from what I value today. And when I've seen things lost, uh, like our deer herd degradation of our uh, air. Uh, those are things that, you know, I, I tend to focus on and speak out. I'm getting older, but my health still is my top priority. And not only of myself, but, but other people. So I think we, we've got different values and different value systems and based upon maybe uh, where we were raised, where we, how long we've been here, and certainly <coughs> what old, how old we are, and probably even gender. I'm curious, Mark. Now you had mentioned about Chesapeake and all the baby boomers. Are you going to be joining them? The answer is is no, um, and the reason the answer is no is because during the course of my travels, I married a Norwegian, and uh, even though it is way different from when it was. I mean, way more populated, and uh, I mean, we have a Walmart in our county and two um, two traffic lights now. It, it's still extremely rural to my wife. But the the one of the things that is uh, I think difficult for everybody who gets older is I remember what it was like when I was a kid. And even though to some people it is still heaven, it'll never be it will never be what it was. So I'm in search of a new dream. That'll probably be uh, on the coast and in Norway because I have that opportunity. Um, so it's, uh, I heard in the last panel in, in Wyoming, I can't remember who it was, but someone said it's, it's bittersweet. Um, my grandfather uh, sold a piece of that land um, back in, um, uh, I think it was 1969 or 70, and he got about $75 an acre. Uh, I can now get $100,000 an acre because it's waterfront. So. The uh, bitter part is it'll never be like I remember it. The sweet part is it's providing a resource for me to do what I want to do. Hi, um, I'd like to ask everybody on the panel, um, what do you think the role of our community churches is in the energy debate and this boom in particular? It doesn't go to church. <laughs> I don't know enough to know. <laughs> <laughs> a little discussion here with our how often we go to church. But anyway. I think this goes back to I made a statement earlier about you know people come to the community and some people buy in and some don't and some feel very isolated. Uh, their neighbors don't talk to them. Uh, I think the churches can play a big role in uh, making people feel more friendly making those of us who live here or have lived here for a long time understand where these newcomers are coming from and what they value and help integrate people into the community uh, and have some, once again, open discussion perhaps like we're, we're having today. Uh, and I know we can't go back and this is one of those, you know, well, when I grew up here. <laughs> but when I grew up here, <laughs> uh, and Sue can testify this, Whatever was going on in the community, whether the Catholic Church was doing something, or the Episcopal Church, or the Congregational, or the Mormon Church, that's all the churches we had, we went. Everybody went and supported. So there wasn't, uh, not saying that we have barriers now, but there was no social uh, lines drawn. Didn't matter what church you went to, what your father did, or your mother did, or how rich you were, or how poor you were. And I, th I think churches can help to, to break down these barriers and help integrate the various people that 
are new to our community and, and do not feel maybe comfortable? I do have an answer. I go to the Catholic Church sometimes, and that's when I learned, it was actually in the Pinedale Catholic Church I learned about Mardi Gras, because we have that influx of Louisiana folks. That's where, was it crayfish, crawfish? What were those really weird looking things, look like bugs? And I mean, that, that's where we had some integration of cultural differences. You know, instead of just those Wyoming Catholics, we got an influx of Louisiana. And actually it did have a, there really was a cultural influx of, of men that cooked and, and that came to church and really, we learned a lot from them. I might go to church more than Ann does, but that could be a stretch. <laughs> yeah. And I happen to be in the process of teaching youth group this year and next year, and I do think I grew up in this church, in this community, and um, I do think they play an important role of places where, it is one of those places where new people come. To, they tend to try and find um, community or people, um, new people to meet. And uh, I think they, so that I think churches play an important role in, in being that kind of space where people can come to meet other people. Uh, and I think it's an important place, at least from a youth perspective, where uh, kids can come together and, you know, hang out and meet each other and, and be in that sort of dialogue. So I think they're, they're great. We do have great, strong churches in this community. We do a lot of things together. The Thanksgiving community dinner, which kind of rotates between two or three churches in town. Uh, great Christmas choirs, which rotate between five or six churches in town. And, and we've kind of maintained those traditions, I think, and added people to them. Um, although I would say that one of the reasons that I think we started when I think my mom started the Thanksgiving dinner was that she saw a lot of people in the community who maybe didn't have family to spend Thanksgiving dinner with. Maybe a lot of those people were workers that were here or people that were new to the community and she felt it was really important for those folks to have a place um, to come on a holiday and celebrate with other people and that's kind of become a wonderful tradition in our community now for three or four years. I think it's happened for four years now maybe. Um, so that, and it's really something we never did before because we didn't need to. Um, as Mary Lynn talked about, everybody knew each other. Everybody had a place to go. Um, everybody was invited to their neighbors. And so our community changed, but I also think it gave us a wonderful opportunity to fill a need and see a need in somebody else and, and provide for that. I think we can do one quick question, then we're going to wrap it up for our panel. Quick question from anyone? OK. Uh, what I'm wondering is the attitude that the uh, company uh, coming in to develop the resources, what their obligation is to the community. Uh, to get back to the Wagon Hill Committee, uh, where we uh, uh, campaigned against nuclear stimulation of natural gas because of its effect on, on the whole community. Uh, that uh, uh, project was going to use nuclear detonations of five 100 kiloton bombs in a single well bore that would be set off sequentially. And that was to uh, see if the gas could be uh, re released that way. All right, we uh, uh, campaigned against that and uh, successfully, and also it was found out that the gas uh, in Colorado uh, was radioactive, but it, it was the concern of uh, the community members, but what the community obligation was. Okay, then when the uh, uh, new process of hydrofracking came up, we thought, aha, we've got a solution now. Uh, I, I don't know how many of the others thought hydrofracking meant uh, stimulating uh, the gas with water, steam, and there were no chemicals or anything involved. Then uh, uh, it turns out that, that hydrofracking included chemicals, all right? The uh, 
attitude of industry was that what those chemicals were was a privileged communication, just like Coca-Cola. Okay. I think, Sally, your question is the obligation that, that companies have to a community. Would anyone like to, to address that? Well, I think most people are aware of the whole fracking issue and the, the changes in the regulations. And I see um, there's going to be a <laughs> something somewhere. Um, yeah, hydraulic fracking, a Wyoming Energy Forum in Laramie, September 26th to 27th. I, obviously, this is a discussion that probably could go on and on. But Sally, I blame your group. Because if we had all that atomic energy, the natural gas here would be radioactive. And I could go out there and see the Jonah like it used to be. No, I'm kidding. No. Okay. I want to finish up. And we're going to make it a, a quick think about three points that you would, three points of advice that each of you would provide to the next um, boom town. And we've been talking about where that's probably going to be here in Wyoming. So who'd like to go first with that? I, actually, I don't have three pieces. I just have one piece of advice, and that is something that Mary Lynn mentioned, which is to generate baseline data, as much baseline data as is possible, so that the impacts really can be measured, assessed, and evaluated, and so that we can develop better practices for the future. And I'll only uh give one piece of advice as well, and it's the same as my, my summary. The reason that this whole exercise has been important is that the um, biggest failure of, the, of, the, of human society is we don't learn, we, have, we don't learn from the past very well. We repeat the same uh, mistakes over and over again. This is, a, is an excellent opportunity to pass on advice uh, for our future generations. I hope the students in the uh, audience have been listening because really it's going to fall on your shoulders to not do the same thing that our parents did and not, not learn from the past. So record these histories, learn the pertinent information, and apply those things to uh, the next situation. I mentioned some things earlier. I guess if I just would say one thing is any in community that's going to be impacted People must realize whether they think it or think or not, they're going to be impacted. Now, as I said, I'm retired, came back here, I don't have a business, um, but I have been impacted, and uh, we've all been impacted. So the baseline data, get organized, communicate with industry, uh, have a clearinghouse for information, uh, hold agencies accountable. Don't expect other people just to stand up for you all the time. Take a voice, be active. As I've said several times, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have been asked by Leslie to help participate in this study. I guess because I am the town historian, I wrote the history of the town um, and therefore was asked to participate in this. And that was the last question we asked all 40 people or so, was uh, if you were to give advice to another community going through this, what would it be? And the answers were very diverse and, and excellent. And so I guess my closing comment, at the risk of sounding a little flippant, and I don't mean to be, but I was telling my husband this last weekend when I got another call to do another interview, at first this, that was really cool, because you know, when the New York Times called 10 years ago, or LA Times, you know, little old Land Noble from Pinedale, Wyoming is getting attention, but we've gotten so met, much of it now so many organizations have called to study us. I'm, I told them, I said, I'm beginning to feel like a lab rat, you know, where people are coming and, and studying us a whole lot. But what I hope happens now is that this is the beginning for the University of Wyoming and that this isn't the wrap up of this project. Yes, we're through with the interviews. Yes, they're transcribed. This is the last of the panels. I hope this isn't done because I think what came out of those interviews was phenomenal. Um, and that, that I hope that it's not just talk, because we've heard a lot of that, we've got to learn from what's happened, that it's, it's more than talk, that it is actual action. I, I don't know that I have anything one of the lab rats. much wiser than that. Mary Lynn already stole my thunder, there will be impacts. So, um, I mean, I, 
and it sounds maybe silly to the rest of you, but I think for us, I mean, to go to another community and, and say, you need to be realistic about the expectations of what's gonna happen in your community. There are gonna be changes, there are gonna be impacts. Some of them are gonna be tough to deal with. Some of them are gonna be great. Um, you're gonna have some wonderful opportunities to um, do different things, meet new people if you choose to, um, and embrace that change if you want to. And I think maybe my only practical piece of advice is surrounding things like zoning and housing and temporary housing and hotels. And you know, we talk a lot about full hotels and empty hotels and um, where's everybody gonna stay and housing prices is making space for what's needed and what's appropriate in your community so that you have some control over what it looks like long term. Well, thank you. Thanks for your comments, panel. Thanks for, for being a part of this. We really appreciate it. Thanks to you, audience members who came and all, all your questions. And also a very um, heartfelt thanks to our moderator, Dr. Dave Kathka, as well as to the Wyoming Humanities Council for funding our project and the School of Energy Resources for helping us in, in filming this. UWTV is, is filming the, the discussion. Um, I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you again, and sorry to have kept you. I appreciate you sitting about 20 minutes later than we expected. Thank you, and good night.